So we're going to start the next presentation now, and I'm going to let Sava introduce himself and the presentation for Crowdfunded Cures. Okay. Yeah, hi guys. So I'm from Crowdfunded Cures, um, and uh, I'm a, a patent attorney and a, a barrister solicitor of High Court of New Zealand and lawyer in Queensland. Um, I did my master's thesis on uh, finding uh, alternatives to the patent system for uh, funding medical research. Uh, we're also partnered with VitaDAO and Molecule. Uh, so the problem we're looking at is really uh, close to me. It's uh, around uh, healthcare innovation and inefficiencies, uh, really inspired by the uh, thesis of uh, Dr. Scannell. Um, basically, uh, US healthcare expenditure is now over 20% of GDP, and um, drugs, new drugs are basically costing you know, over a billion dollars per year and, and exponentially increasing. Uh, so generic drugs can help. So the problem is that under the current uh, patent system, uh, there's a patent-centric model. If you go and talk to a VC, they just want to hear, have you got a patentable molecule? Have you got a new um, composition of matter patent? And it doesn't matter um, if you've got, like, the cure for some disease or, or, or whatever it might be. That it's just there's no way they can make money out of it unless you've got a new uh, a patentable molecule and as a result safe, low cost and effective treatments are being ignored. Uh, so the reason for this is what happens is this thing called a patent cliff. So as drugs are newly developed, they're on patent and they're very, very expensive and that's what they use to get their money back basically. They charge a monopoly price and then what happens is that as soon as the patent goes off, uh, as soon as the drug goes off patent, the, the um, price of that crashes to almost sort of a, a nominal value and because they make it in China and India and all these other places. That's called the patent cliff and all the profitability goes away. And so basically generic drugs are essentially uh, public goods. Generic drugs are off-patent drugs. So 90% of the drugs uh, that are prescribed in the US are off-patent. And the issue is that method of use patents or different kinds of uh, patents where you're using, you're looking at the treatment protocol, so you take a, a, an off-patent drug and you try and find a new use for it. You can't stop um, doctors basically taking an off-patent drug and using that for a new use. You can't build a business model based on suing uh, doctors and patients. So essentially, these new uses for off-patent drugs are non-rivalrous and non-excludable public goods. And so there's, there's this other problem, which is that doctors don't want to prescribe um, generic drugs off-label unless you've got large phase three clinical trials. And the FDA also is not going to approve your drug for the new use. So that ensures that these off-patent drugs, you might have some very small studies showing efficacy, but it's never going to be a mainstream treatment that helps millions and millions of people because uh, what you need is very large clinical trials and that costs a lot of money. You're talking for generic drug repurposing. Um, I mean, for a new drug, you're talking sort of billions and billions of dollars. For generic drug repurposing, you're actually talking sort of 10 to $30 million just because it's a lot faster um, to get to phase three. Basically, you, can, uh, you don't have to bother about the um, safety of, uh, well, the safety has already been established, so you can move straight to phase three. And then it also, uh, you can get to market a lot faster. So instead of waiting around 15 years for your longevity drug or your cancer drug or whatever it might be, um, you only have to wait three years. But there is this kind of market failure. There's also this massive opportunity. So, you know, there's thousands and thousands of generic drugs. Uh, there's, there's also thousands of, of nutraceuticals, th things that we call supplements that people spend billions and billions of dollars on. But again, no method to enforce a monopoly price over these off-patent drugs. There's only a very tiny fraction of the drugs um, that are out there on the market might be patentable. So there's this huge lost opportunity uh, and, and value and market opportunity. Uh, also, as I was saying, is massive cost savings for generics. So uh, $313 billion in 2019 in the US alone from use of generics and $2.2 trillion over 10 years in the US. Uh, but there's no mechanism to basically capture those cost savings and drive them into the present under the patent system. Uh, so this isn't just sort of science fiction. There are a bunch of um, 
uh, repurposing opportunities. It's not quack medicine. Uh, naltrexone uh, can be used to treat chronic pain. Uh, BCG vaccine has been shown that it can treat, uh, help stabilize blood sugar levels and type 1 diabetes. It's also been shown to boost innate immunity um, for respiratory illness, so it could be sort of seen as like a, a universal vaccine, which one of our um, partners, Open Source Pharma Foundation, are also looking at. Uh, there's tetrathiomelibdate, which is uh, basically it's a copper chelation uh, agent and it's essentially like an industrial chemical, but it is, helps reduce incidence of breast cancer recurrence, um, but of, uh, off patent. Uh, fluvoxamine is a bit of a, uh, that can actually, has been shown in a Brazilian clinical trial, uh, 1,500 people to reduce chance of death by 90% and reduce uh, hospitalizations by 30% which is on par actually with Merck's uh, brand new patented drug called Molnupilavir, which is uh, $800 a course. A course of fluvoxamine is $10 a course. So there's this massive cost difference uh, for off-patent drugs versus patented drugs. Uh, Molnupilavir is expected to cost around $12 billion um, by 2025. So all these sales, you know, all this money being spent on patented drugs and basically just not even a tiny fraction being spent on repurposing drugs. So there's this massive uh, missed opportunity because of this sole reliance on the patent system in order to make ROI. So also uh, the elephant in the room is around uh, repurposing psychedelics, cannabis and plant-based medicine. A lot of these are off patent. So something like cannabis, we've had the, um, you know, the, the opiate crisis has killed millions and millions of people. Uh, it's caused, uh, it's it caused approximately a a trillion dollars apparently in, in, in the US and uh, in, in Canada over uh, in every year. Uh, you can't OD on cannabis and research shows that you can actually reduce reliance on opiate use by managing chronic pain with cannabis. However, despite off-label use of cannabis, you can go to an off-label sort of uh, a kooky kind of doctor and get, and get prescribed cannabis off-label. There's no FDA approved cannabis product or cannabis flower. There are, there's, there's one called uh, Marinol, I believe, or, um, which is used to treat uh, cancer pain. It's a very narrow indication uh, also to treat, um, uh, improve your, your basically munchies. You know, you can eat a lot more um, when, when you're sick. Uh, and also uh, CBD was the big one for uh, childhood epilepsy. But no mainstream um, uh, use of cannabis to treat chronic pain, even though it's basically used like that off-label. Uh, same with psilocybin. Um, you know, research has shown that it has very large, uh, rapid, sustainable antidepressant effects. Um, you know, I, 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 I'm a very pro, and it, it's and it's it seems to yeah that, that's the other issue is it's an off-patent drug, uh, it's available off-patent. There are attempts to basically tweak the molecule. However, um, this is this off-patent molecule is the one that we might have co-evolved with, and might have actually helped. Um, you know, guide our evolution, human evolution and things like that. So there are reasons why we should want to promote the uh, development of, of off-patent, safe and effective um, molecules. Uh, so the solution is uh, basically looks, it's called a pay-for-success contract, or you could think of it like a retroactive public goods funding, which uh, Vitalik uh, Buterin had been talking about as a way to fund uh, public good medicines. So the idea is that basically the, the tricky part is finding somebody that's willing to pay for um, repurposed generic drugs and essentially paying for the data that's encrypted in, say, an I IP NFT or, or clinical trial data. If you uh, successfully repurpose the drug, then you will get a premium or you'll get a prize, so, you know, say $10 million, $20 million. There, there, there will be people out there that want to treat illness, that, that, that it's worth 20 million pounds or dollars or 50 million pounds for them to find a cheap off-patent treatment uh, for their particular disease. But that is the tricky part and that's what we're focused on. You know, that's kind of our, 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 our difficulty. But once you've got the success payer, you can get then an impact investor that goes and basically acts like a VC, goes and finds the right generic drugs, funds the generic drug repurposing protocol. Um, so the question is like, why is this different from like traditional sort of public funding, like don't we fund clinical trials for repurposing generic drugs? There's a lot of advantages to using this particular model. First, it's decentralized, you know, it's merito mer meritocratic, you don't have to like uh, know the funding agencies, you don't have to, um, as, as Lawrence was talking about, this spend hundreds of hours going through these grant funding applications. You can't really be a maverick, think outside the box, 
and things like that. It's not meritocratic. This is a purely decentralized way of doing science. You've got a prize, you've got an outcome. If you take it to market and if you succeed, it doesn't matter who you are. If you get the outcome, you'll get the funding. But essentially, uh, there, there are other advantages. So risk is transferred from, from like government and from philanthropy and from the high net worth individuals onto the markets. People are willing to take risks. That's what the markets do. It's like uh, you know, oil barons and things like that and people that, that do very high risk research and VCs, they take a lot of punts, they take a lot of shots at goal. So they're okay with taking it on risk as long as the upside is there. And they can price it in. So if your prize is like a million dollars, then they might only want to lend you $200,000 or $500,000 um, depending on what they think the chances are of success. So it's basically the, there's a market model to factor in uh, the risk. Uh, also, farmer industry, they're a lot more well um, equipped. Uh, they're better paid than, private in, uh, than, than the public sector. Uh, the free market is very good at allocating resources. As long as, there's, as, long as you can make 10% per annum, which isn't a lot of money, um, you know, you've got $30 trillion available to invest in, in your particular product. Um, also, uh, there's this arbitrage opportunity. These are drugs that have never been looked at before by private industry. I mean, they can do reformulations, and we'll talk about doing reformulations later on, but definitely you're not going to go to a VC and say, hey, I've got a repurposed generic drug, give me some money, they'll laugh you out the door, and I've got a, a method of use patent or something like that, unless there's some way they can enforce the monopoly price and stop other people or have this pay-for-success mechanism. So, I mean, we're, we're interested in this. We think there is, this is the future of NFTs, basically. So, you know, at one stage, you've got, like, Board Ape Yacht Club, um, you know, sort of primary use is visual display. On the other side, we've got uh, an NFT representing a safe and effective off-patent treatment for your disease. How much would that NFT be worth to you? And it should be worth more than a picture of, um, you know, uh, of, of, of apes. So, and, and, and then why DAOs, basically? So th there is a reason why uh, there's not just a trivial use case for DAOs. Um, with open source pharma IP NFTs, you can allow fractionalized ownership. We've been talking about that earlier on the day. There's some very interesting things you can do around fractionalization, or around allowing liquidity uh, with the markets and, and people to basically go and fund these sorts of things. Open source pharma NFTs um, create a market now for public good medicine, so that's on the other side. They basically are like a prize for, for um, incentivizing people to, to invest in these IP NFTs. And what it would allow is someone like VitaDAO to invest in an in open source medicine. So it would allow the community uh, researchers to come to VitaDAO and say, hey, I can repurpose metformin, I can repurpose rapamycin, I can repurpose NMN, I can repurpose any other of these off-patent drugs, Reservatrol, um, and I can get funding for that through VitaDAO. And it doesn't matter that it's off-patent, it just matters whether my drug will work, and that's what we all should care about. Um, and there's also like other advantages, very secure, Web3 is fast, transparent, secure. You know, you can raise hundreds of millions of dollars in seconds. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's all, all also online and transparent. More importantly, it can't be shut down. It's a protocol. So, you know, if you, you, you're creating like a disruptive mechanism that perhaps my incubants might want to uh, uh, not be happy with, with a, with a DAO, you can, you can be uh, sure that um, perhaps you're a lot more difficult and a lot more, uh, a bit more of a moving target. Uh, so, as we were saying before, it's like the DAO funding model. On one side of the pay-for-success contract, you've got payers. They're the important ones. They're basically the ones that decide to pay for the outcomes. And then the DAO then goes and finds the research, uses like the, the super intelligence of, 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 of capitalism, basically, to find, uh, to crowdsource the answer and then fund uh, the right research uh, using uh, these open source pharma IP NFTs. Um, so we're doing a pilot at the moment. We're interested in longevity. We've partnered with Vita Dow and the Longevity Prize who are willing to put um, some money towards this particular um, pilot. And our target is to do an open source pharma longevity prize NFT drop via our website. Um, the idea is to phase the uh, fund the phase two uh, A RCT by Dr. Brad Stanfield, who's a, quite a popular YouTuber, also another New Zealander. Um, and to fund, uh, to look at rapamycin plus exercise in the elderly. Uh, success criteria will be that there's a safe, this is a safe treatment and that it improves, um, uh, there's a trend towards improvement in the uh, primary clinical outcome, which is uh, the 30 second chest stand test. 
So this is, this is a state diagram of the, mo uh, of the model, basically. So you have VitaDAO, you have the payer fund, say we, we raise a million dollars, and then in return, VitaDAO will, will fund, uh, uh, put 400K, and then uh, towards a researcher, they'll be issued with an IP NFT. If the research outcome is met, is not met, there's no outcome payment to VitaDAO. If it is met, there's an outcome payment, so that closed the loop, creates a scalable business model for open source medicine. Um, so this is kind of our, our dream, I guess, the go-to-market plan. Uh, we want to launch as a non-profit impact DAO using a SAFT, and that creates these, uh, this prize model, this bounty model, to basically de-risk finding new uses for generic drugs, plant medicines, and other unmonopolizable therapies. Even things like, um, you know, like, like lifestyle interventions, meditation, diets, things like that. However, there is this kind of, there's not a lot of profit to be made in this kind of Kickstarter model. Um, the for-profit uh, element and, and the big opportunity is around a public good pharma company. We leverage IP NFTs, uh, patents, where we, we can look at reformulation, we can look at leveraging data exclusivity like uh, orphan drug exclusivity, uh, and more importantly, we can look at engaging with payers to agree to pay these pay-for-success contracts and agree to pay us for our branded version of the repurposed generic drug. Uh, so, yeah, if you've got any questions, um, you can see us on our website and, um, yeah, that's some social media and stuff. And um, if I've got any time, I'm happy to take any questions. Otherwise, um, yeah. Thank you, Sava. So, th <laughs> Sava will be hanging out here for a bit. If you want to speak to him, um, you can still be in the